make this topic simple for you. Go to the very basics. Online platform is a good platform for us by which we can speak to all of you. I will tell you what all has to be done. What all you have to know when you handle a patient or PCO as an <laughs> So first of all, first figure you have to know is that PCO affects one in 10 women. It's a massive number. One in 10 women, the worldwide are having PCOS. So it means somewhere around the number given is around 15% of the number we have. And out of this, a large number of them will develop complications. Now, we are basically looking at the fertility part. We are at the fertility part, but I say this is wrong. This is wrong on our part. We have to think about endometrial cancer. We have to think about uh, how it's going to affect the annual healthcare costing, diagnosis of multiple issues. Can be It can be in OSA, can be CVD, can be MIs, can be osteoporosis, can be type 2 diabetes. 50% of the, of the women are undiagnosed. So my topic uh, will try to evolve as we are having better understanding about PCOS. And I, I think I'm going to go beyond the cosmetics. When the young girls want to look good and they go for laser therapy, they want to go for some weight loss and surgeries. Let's see what happens in PCOS. And very important part here is anxiety and depression, which comes in. It's a weight gain and there is insulin resistance and facial hair growth. All the things come up and finally the battle is with the infertility when we talk about uh, talk when I talk to you about an infertility specialist. So this is how a PCO woman feels and a PCO is pretty common first of all. Around 15% of women have it and this is all what she feels and here the killing thing is and they start coming to us at this point of time, when they have acne, when they have got hysterism, they come, they start coming to us, then they start gaining weight, then they have hair loss, irregular periods, infertility, high levels of testosterone, we call it in hyperandrogenemia. So she's confused what to do, and she comes to one of us, and let's see how we can manage her, how we can give her happiness. All these young girls who come to us, the women who are uh, anovulatory, how do, how do we look at them? So this is the way things happen. And I'm going to cover my topic in the various headings. And this is the PCO, the ovary, about which we're going to talk about to all of you. So we have irregular periods. We have excess of androgens, PCODs. And you can see how a normal ovary differs from a polycystic ovary. There you'll find that we get one, one ovary ovulating, one follicle coming every month. And here we have multiple immature follicles. When we have multiple immature follicles, we have, got, we have got increased levels of E2, we have got increased levels of LH, and when E2 and LH go high, the levels of FSH, they come down, and when FSH is down, the woman doesn't ovulate. That's the basic uh, thing which occurs in a PCOD patient. So these are the common questions which people ask, and now I start my talk here. Uh, they ask, what is the PCO? What are the causes of this? Is what what your patients want to know? As I told you, my friends, gentlemen, ladies, uh, by no means I am here to teach you what happens in PCOD that you already know. Yeah, let's see what patients they ask you when you are in the OPD. You get large number of uh, young women coming to you. Your husband, your relatives come to you. They have these common problems. Doctor, sir, what but is your voice not coming? A little increase. Okay, fine. Fine. So when they come to you, they want to ask you, thank you so much for uh, checking me up. And they want to ask you, what is PCOS? What causes PCOS? Who can get PCOS? How is PCOS diagnosed? So multiple people. And now PCOS, a lot of people are coming into it. We have got, here we have, when you talk about PCOS, we have got cosmetologists. We have cosmetologists coming here. We have dermatologists who comes into this field. We have got gynecs and we have uh, surgeons who do bariatric surgeries. We have counselors, they all come here. But finally, the patients will come to you. So these are common things they want to ask you and you have to learn what to tell to them. So I think uh, I'll draw my energy from HRA PCOS guidelines of 2018. 
and we are now touching number of around 257 people have joined us and thank you so much for being here in such large numbers i can't see all of you on the screen but uh, i am always told by my team that don't have a class on sundays people won't join or people are i'm so happy that you all are fighting covid you all are breathing cold and you're here let's do justice to the topic in a very good way so thank you guys you are my energy you are i always say that you are like my glucon d i get so much of energy from you so uh, why is pco relevant first of all that it affects women between 14 and 45 years i'm going to give you some answers just keep in your mind pco affects between 14 and 45 years around 18 percent of the women have got pcos 18 percent of pcos hota hai. It can have abnormal agility, infertility, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, lipid derangements. People can have CVD. They can have MI. The multiple things can happen. There can be depression, obstructive sleep, apnea. All these things are part of PCOS. So when you look at the women, don't only look at their ovaries. That's my request to you. They have come to you. They need help. So treat them in. Treat them in totality and here look here this, there are guidelines available from uh, the ashray and they came up in year 2018 and by the time the talk ends you'll be getting these guidelines in your mailbox also so look at look at it we got nearly every society in the world foxy ashray asri monash kripos every society has joined hands then they have they have aligned with these guidelines. That's very important for us to know. So the guidelines, these are these guidelines are endorsing Rotterdam's criteria. This you have to know. And they give, they give a lot of value to the Rotterdam, Rotterdam criteria. And this criteria meant that there can be oligo annovulation, which we call it, call it as ovarian causes or annovulation, we say it. Then we can have clinical or biochemical hyperandrogenism or we get ovary having PCOD on ultrasound. So a woman can have these three things. In case any two, in case any two of them come positive, in case any two of them come positive, we say that the girl is having PCOS. Now moving one step ahead. Now, I always thought, let's, uh, let's see, there is something called phenotyping. There are something called phenotyping of the PCOS. And nowadays we are moving towards phenotyping in a very, very sensitive way. And for to understand phenotyping, we have to know the definitions first. I've spoken to about the Rotterdam's criteria. There are some other definitions also. Also available with us. And one is the NIH 1990. They compare ovulated dysfunction and hyperandrogenemia, which can be clinical or biochemical. And they say both of them are required. So they are here, here they are not talking about ultrasound. Then we have Rotterdam. It talks about polycystic ovarian morphology. So ultrasound has been added here. Then we have got androgen excess PCOS of 2006. Here they again talk about hyperandrogenemia and ovulatory dysfunction where we have anovulation or irregular periods. Then comes ASHRAE and ASRM of NIH2012. Here they bring in the ultrasound, polycystic ovarian morphology, and then they bring in phenotyping. So what we have to understand is that whenever the policies are being made by gynecologists, in any format, they always add an ultrasound. But when they are made by other societies, they don't add ultrasound to it. They basically go by irregular periods, clinical or biochemical hyper epigenic. This is what this is one thing I wanted to share with you. Now, what are these phenotypes? Phenotypes kya hote hai and why are the phenotypes important? There are four phenotypes of PCOS. One is A, B, C, and D. And these phenotypes are in these combinations. They can be all three coming together. Ultrasound, anovulation, hyperandrogenemia. 
then there are combinations of hypersensitivity. Look at this, hyperandrogenemia is there in all A, B, C. In one, they, we add all. In B, they have only ovulation problem. In C, they have ovarian polycystic morphology. And in D, they have they have not taken hyperandrogenemia. These four combinations are there. And out of this, the most commonest combination is of type 1 or classic. Type 1 or classic, that is 54% gentleman ladies. 54% is this combination. And this is the one which we are seeing on daily basis. Many times you guys call me and ask, ovary mein to nahi hai, but hyperandrogenemia hai, or annulation, and then what do you do? Immediately you know that this is a case of type 2 classic. Or, you know, it's a type 3 type of phenotype where we have these two things or we have only androgenemia and PCOS, which is 8%. And because you find that type 1 and type 3 are the commonest. Now here, I won't go into the details more than this, but you have to know that try, please try to phenotype your patient. This is important. <clears throat> Always try to rule out other conditions, though normally we don't do it. But definitely, yes, in case the patient is young, healthy, we don't carry out, rule out adrenal disorder, CH, Cushing, and we don't do this. But basically, we do rule out hypothyroidism. So I suggest that always do these three tests. I'm giving you some golden words. Do vitamin D for all the patients. Do prolactin and do thyroid. So all the three things will normally come deranged in the PCOD patient. <clears throat> Prolactin, we normally don't treat. You treat hypothyroidism and prolactin will become normal. This is one take-home message I want to give to you. Don't start giving the patient thyroid and cabergolin together. Normally, if you give eltroxin, this will heal prolactin. Then vitamin D, I think is pretty important. The test costs around rupees 1500. So you may not do that test for all. You give them a sachet of, or you give them 60,000 units of, of vitamin D3. For eight weeks and maintenance, I bring your attention towards our last uh, curtain razor uh, resonance on vitamin D. Please read from there. Now, what are the common doubts of treating gynecologists? So the gynecologist also wants to. Until now, I spoke to you about what patients want to ask you. Hello, Coming to what gynecologists want to ask, they say general gynecologists they want to know how common is infertility in these patients? This is a common question. How do we modify their lifestyles? What are insulin sensitizers? Choice of ovulation induction. How do we treat gonadotropins? Do we treat them or we don't treat them? Which type of gonadotropins should we take? HMG, FSH, LH, HCG, what do we take? Do, can we get ovarian hyperstimulation? How do we handle it? Should we carry out fresh ET or a frozen ET? And what is the success rate of IVF in PCOS? So these are common things that people want to ask. And I will take you to the guidelines of 2018. So the management of infertility is a very small part. I think we have to look at the patient in totality. And here it is these two things which are very important. In case you treat only infertility part, the woman will become pregnant and then she'll have multiple complications later. And But we have to give them something called holistic care. It's a holistic care we want to give to our patients. And this is what I'm going to teach you today. How to treat our whole, whole ovarian pathology in totality. So now comes the point that how do we look at it? So now we have 280 people with us, you know, 285 people had joined. My answer to you would be that whenever you look at any paper, look at the paper in four aspects. Every paper has got four parts of recommendations. Stronger the recommendations, better is the paper. So in India, what happens is that uh, people said that in India, people have their own policies. They do whatever they want to do. They preach wrong things. You'd be surprised that I was taking a similar talk in Kenya. And I had an audience of around 200 Kenyan doctors from Kenyan OBG Society. They only wanted to know about something called hyponid. They want to know about hyponid only. In Kenya, their favorite drug is hyponid. 
I was quite surprised. So in India, we don't use hypnotic, but people are doing what they feel like doing. And uh, let's see what the guidelines tell you. So guidelines will give you an answer in four parts. Pella part hai categories ka. They will whatever they write these guidelines they are being made by the guideline development group we call it GDG. They always give the answer by categorizing their guidelines in by four ways. You have to pick up that guideline by importance of these four things or five things. So first of all is the category of guideline. Here we talk about EBR, CCR, and CP. <clears throat> This paper I'll be sending to you immediately after the class is over because my fundo is that you all of should read yourself to learn better. So just know that there is something called evidence-based recommendations, clinical consensus recommendations, and clinical practice points. So we call them EBR, CCR, and CPP. Just remember this: that this is an important category. You read any paper which is coming internationally; they'll have four-prong way of categorizing. The second method is called grade of recommendation. Grade of recommendation that is called and it is based upon a system called grade. Now, grading, the, the, uh, the grad stands for grading of recommendations, assessment, development, and evaluation. So you find that when, when you come to this, it goes in the reverse order. When we come to four pointer, strong recommendation as you move up. It is a conditional recommendation. So strongest recommendation will be like one, two, three, and four. So I've told you two things till now. One is the category. Categories EBR, CCR, CPP. Strongest is BR. strongest here is EBR. Remember that. And the weakest is CPP. I won't say it's the weakest, but on the ground, EBR is more powerful. When you come to the grad, Always great. We look at more number of stars here. More the number, stronger it is. Less the number of stars, bigger it is. Now we come to the science of plus. You will find it is called quality. Now here we have something called quality or certainty of evidence. Now. Here we find that it is goes ulta. It go this way. So very high confidence, moderate confidence, limited confidence, and very little confidence. So when you read an article, always try to look at what the category says, what the grad says, what the quality says, and then gentlemen, ladies, the most important thing here is recommendation terms. They will ask whether it should, could, or should not. So, it's got a meaning. The article I'll be sending to you very, very quickly. So, understand the meaning of should, could, and should not. Sorry, so, screen when, share that, when they say should, do it. When they say could, do it. Should not means that we should not do it. So, I've covered for you all these four criteria of reading a paper. So, our job at ICT is not to give you knowledge, knowledge is there everywhere. I want to tell you how to read a paper so that next time when you read a paper from Cochrane or read any good guidelines, immediately you should know, you should ask, start, start asking yourself, okay, boss, what is the criteria? What are the category? What is the recommendation? What is the grade? And uh, what is the quality? So based upon that, you pick up the answer. In our country till now, so to quite an extent, we are guided by the pharmas. Pharmas come and tell us which is a better drug for PCOs, for anything, and we buy it. We are not reading between the lines. I don't say what we are learning is right or wrong, but I think we should develop our own methodologies to learn things. So I focused on Azure 2018. I thought it's the right way to connect with you all. And here, this guidelines has got six chapters. It's got six chapters. Six are there. There are eight appendix and five algorithms. So I would like to say that when you get this booklet today, in case you don't have it, I see it family already has it for people who've joined us new, they may not be having it. Read the algorithms and read the appendices. They're very, very beautifully made. 
and read chapter 5 for infertility. Read chapter 5 for infertility and chapter 1 basically for the assessment and diagnosis. So since I'm at, uh, this talk is primarily towards infertility, I'll go to chapter 5. And chapter 5 here... Papa, you're going to go to the Choco. Papa, you're going to go to This is chapter 5. This is chapter 5. In chapter 5, we have got these following recommendations. 5.1a, b, 2, 2. Then we have 5. As you can look at, come to 5, 9, we have got these many recommendations. So these are the recommendations which come from chapter 5 of the Ashray 2018. So I've told you there are 6 chapters, 8 appendix, 5 algorithms, and we focus on the chapter 5. This is important. But before I go to chapter 5, I picked up certain things which are important for you guys. And one is the chapter 1, 1.4 recommendation, the role of ultrasound. This is in PCOD ovary. You know, when we have large number of follicles, we say that you've got a PCO. I know this is PCO morphology. And even a blind person can assess, upon, assess that PCO morphology. Some people do sono AVC, some people do. Uh, more detailed ultrasound, 3D imaging, but PCO, the ovaries, we as a gynecologist, we don't miss. But here, what I want to convey to you guys is something very simple. That is that woman less, girl less than eight years, girl less than eight years, or eight years after men, ultrasound is not recommended. <coughs> Girl less than eight years and less than eight years after menarche, ultrasound is not recommended. This is CCR. It's a consensus recommendation. I don't say it is 100% correct, but this is a recommendation. Second is, <clears throat> when we look at the ovary, we should use a vaginal ultrasound. Never do diagnose ultrasound by TAS. Always use TVS and I think we should use seven and higher megahertz probe. This is important for us. Then volume more than 10 ml of the ovary. Volume of an ovary more than 10 ml and the follicles per ovary of more than 20. Follicle number per ovary more than 20 is the marker of somebody having PCOS. Just remember that. Also remember that in patients with irregular periods, when the woman has got ovulatory dysfunction, I call it OD from now on, and hyperandrogenism. There are two features. Hai, ultrasound is not necessary. Ultrasound will, however, identify the complete PCO phenotype. That's all. It will make it from any other category to classic one. That's all it can do, which is the commonest also. But for us, all the girls and boys who are present here. For us, most important here is ovulation induction. So ultrasound is the one which we normally use and try to, for this means that we have to always look for phenotype one as far as possible. There's a classic phenotype. 1.5, chapter one, recommendation 1.5 I picked up and that said, is there any role of doing an AMH? So we find that a lot of people nowadays they have got fertility panels. They can be male, they can be female, they can be PCO panels. You'll find that any girl who comes to us with some hyperandrogenemia, we just put a PCO panel. For her. And PCO panel will have testosterone, free testosterone, androgen, sex hormone binding globulins, it will have LH, FSH, so whatever you can think of, it will be there. So for now, we have 300 people logged in at this point of time. 300 is a huge number on a cold Sunday morning. <clears throat> so I like, like to tell you one thing very simply, that there is no role of doing AMH to diagnose PCOS. AMH we do as a fertility specialist because we have to decide our protocol and dosages. That is okay. But to diagnose PCO, it should not yet be used. And this is a strong evidence-based uh, recommendation. <clears throat> But there's an emerging evidence that it will help us. So I will say we do AMH, but it's a different purpose because we have to 
make them ovulate and we have to see what, how much dose we want to give to the patients. It's important for us, but not for routine gynecologists and not for routine diagnosis. Now, clinical hyperandrogenism, we normally never look at it. Even I tend to ignore it many times. But here we have to know that it's pretty important and clinical hyperandrogenism is one of the most important factors for a young woman whom we are handling or a young girl. Hyperandrogenemia, acne, alopecia, hirsutism. And due to this, all these people are going to cosmetologists or dermatologists. And people who are actually having a ball are the ones who do laser and who do weight reduction. Somehow we forget that these girls should come to us. They should come to us. And the treatment for them can be plain, simple metformin. We give them metformin or we give them OCPs and they will reverse. But somehow they don't come to us now and they go to more advertised fields and they get, and that that will again reoccur in them. So what I want to tell you is that healthcare professionals like you, so detach yourself from being a plain, simple infertility specialist. You are a doctor. You are a healthcare professional. A young girl comes to you to talk to her. Just don't give her a dying tablet or something and send her home. Do look at her hyperandrogenemia. Look at her, her depressive state, how she's feeling and try to treat her. So there are two recommendations I picked up from chapter 1.1.3 and 1.1, 1.3.4. .1 and these are that we have to grade, we, we should carry out very way, Gellerman scoring, and we should know about how they are doing and always do Ludwig's visual score. I also don't do it routinely. I also want to implement, implement it in my practice, but I'm also not doing it. I am guilty myself about this. So Ferryman Galloway is important and Ludwig's score is important. I'll be giving you the booklet in the next 45 minutes. Go through it. <clears throat> You'll get two booklets from us today. One is the antioxidant guidelines which we have made. It's a small booklet which we have made for you. Read that. That's the resonance and the booklet on PCOD. And again, I, some, I saw something more interesting. Chapter 4 is a talk about inositols. I picked it up because inositols are pretty exciting for me. And inositols, uh, we give in the, when somebody has got hyperandrogenemia. So these women have got high testosterone, they have got high weight, more weight, they got fertility issues, but somehow we are always stuck at this point. We only look at this. This is our failure. Complete failure of all of us, all 300 of us who are present here. Let's take a pledge. They don't only look at our fertility. Look at other things. In case you correct her testosterone and weight gain, probably she won't require us. She won't require us. So we'll become defunct. So, but that's more important. It's good to do the right practice. So I say that always try to treat testosterone, hyperandrogenemia, and weight gain, and fertility will occur by itself. But one thing is for sure that we have insulin resistance. And a large number of them have it. 80% of women who are obese and 30 to 40% of lean girls also have got insulin resistance. There can be CVD, there can be metabolic disorders. So hyperinsulinemia management is the key to the pathology. What came earlier? Gentlemen, ladies, IR or PCOS, we don't know, but they are, it's a very complex, naughty problem and we don't have any answer. So these are few figures when IR, insulin resistance occurs. Why does it occur? It occurs at the level of tyrosine, uh, phosphorylation, serine phosphorylation. It occurs at the level of ovaries, uh, hepatic, renal. A lot of things are here. But in the end, we have got hyperinsulinemia and hyperandrogenemia. This is what I just want to leave, park this thing with you. And it's a very complex thing. I think the best place to read is a book called Spirov. In case you need copy of Spiroff, Spiroff, do write to me. But Spiroff is the right book to read uh, about 
this particular condition. But one thing is for sure, we have got hyperandrogenemia here, so we want to give them anti-androgens. And we have got hyperinsulinemia, so we want to treat insulin resistance. This is one thing which we are trying to do here. Let's see how do we do it. So there are multiple receptors present. There are it's a whole, whole pathway in, in case you look at it from uh, one to nine, one to eight is a whole pathway which is occurring. And primarily the problem comes with the tyrosine kinase activation. It comes with glut transporters, which will transport the, uh, the, the glucose molecules inside. And then finally we have the whole mechanism of glucose uptake and conversion. So all things are occurring. And in case something goes wrong with the receptors here, then we end up with insulin resistance. And then there will be hyperinsulinemia. And this will bring hyperandrogen. So all three are very, very close friends. To break the nexus, we have to give them insulin sensitivities, which we can give. Definitely we can give. <clears throat> now, they, they increase the sensitivity. So what does these insulin sensitizers do? They increase the sensitivity. And when they increase the sensitivity, we will have reduced, we'll have reduced insulin resistance, and then we'll have more of glucose coming inside. And that's the way the thing happens. So there are two drugs about which I want to tell you in very briefly. There are two drugs about which we need to talk. One is myonis at all, other is decuronicin. Both are available in the body. The myonis at all is in the ovary. It's very high in the follicular fluid and DCI is more in the liver, muscle and fat. Just remember this particular thing. I won't go to details of this. So myonicetol works through the second messenger. There's a mechanism. It activates insulin, insulin receptors. So it increases the glucose uptake. So there are two ways the both of them work. Uh, one increases cellular glucose uptake, other increases glycogen synthesis. One is present more in the follicular fluid, other is present more in the liver fat and muscles, then DCI and MCI. Now, interesting thing out of the two things here is that in case we give high levels of DCI, in case we don't give proper combinations, there can be a problem and levels of DCI can go high. And levels of DCI going high means that we have decreased to second. So normally companies, they are combining 40 is to one of, of myonicetol and DCI is one, and or they take 19 is to one. These two combinations are found in the market. You have to know that we don't take excessive amounts of excessive amounts of DCI. That's very very important. Dihydroinositol and MI is myonicetol. So they increase. They lead to normal insulin sensitivity. The ratio recommended is 40 is to one. Some companies gave 19 is to 1. But let's see what, what are the guidelines they say. Till now, now, 40 is to 1 is, they say, should be considered. They are an effective dosage. And look at the recommendations here. So we have the recommendation here and here. So one is a grade, other is the category. I've told you this. I, I, I want to teach you to learn how should we read a recommendation. To read a recommendation, there are four ways I've told you already. Recommendation 4.7.1, recommendation of ASHRAE, when we are reading, we get four factors. I've told you all four factors. Factor one is should. Should is that thing I told you. That is the recommendation. Is it karna hai nahi karna hai? Should, could, should not. I've told you this. Then look at EBR. How is the EBR? EBR is evidence-based recommendation. You see, consider it experimental. And then in case you look at the, uh, the, uh, the category and grad, this is category and grad for all of you who have, get somebody joined late, you'll get the booklet in some time. So here we come to know that it is not a highly recommended thing. 
always take advice of your healthcare professional before taking DCI or MCI. This is what is written in the guidelines and I'm going to give you that. In the morning, when I started my day, I said, let's look at what's available in the market. In the market, they are sent, selling these combinations, something like this. Here, I'm not talking about any company, but look at it, myocetol, 550 milligram, Kiro inositol, 13.8 milligram, green tea, vitamin D3, folic acid, chromium, picolinate. These are the few combinations people are giving and they normally give 200 units of vitamin D to it. These are all the top brands of the country which I have taken. And But just see the difference between myocetol and decuronicetol. Look at the ratio, 550 is to 14. And the brand I picked up was this. Lovely brand, as you can see, it contains uh, myocetol. In case you look at the myocetol, it contains one gram myocetol. And then it has got so many multivitamins. It's full of multivitamins. And they, every multivitamin is an antioxidant and maybe helping her in ovulation. Again, a brand which I picked up, this contains myocetol. It doesn't contain, now in case look here, it doesn't contain DCI. It only contains myocetol. And again, one more combination which I found was metformin and myocetol, 500 and 600. So one more oral combination, because you look at it, this basically contains myocetol, vitamin D3 and folic acid. So myocetol here is two gram. So the dose of myocetol is varying between 500 mg to two gram, as I want to tell you. We still don't have any recommendation what dose is right. We are not clear about it. But overall, look at it. There are, again, one brand, myocetol 550 and inositol 13.8 milligram. This is the average dose of myocetol which you give to people is around 500 milligrams per day. This is the dose. And some have gone to one gram and some have gone to two grams. Some give DCI, some don't give DCI. So with this, I come to the, come to the main topic for the day. The topic for the day is assessment and treatment of infertility. That's the topic for me today. And as I move ahead, before I move ahead, uh, there are around 12 things I'm going to cover, 12 slides I'm going to show to you. I'll give you a take-home message, quick take-home message, and I'll keep moving. <laughs> but before I'm moving ahead, <laughs> as I'm moving ahead, I'll just take a break of a few seconds, and this is my telephone number. Please wrote... Many of you have would have joined us directly. This is my telephone number. Please check my telephone number and save it. And I'm also giving the number of uh, uh, Akriti. Akriti's number is 844-710-9848. So please note her number also. I'm just giving the break of two seconds. Uh, note this number, save your numbers. And Akriti can put the numbers in the chat box also. Yes, sir. Okay. So the women with PCOS are at increased risk of GDM, preeclampsia, preterm birth, miscarriage, stillbirth, longer time to conception, poor embryo quality, reduced embryo implantation. So talk about a thing and PCO can do it. So it's very, very important that we treat PCO when we want to do any fertility treatment. Hyperglycemia is a burning issue. Weight monitoring is a burning issue. But I think most important is the mind. The mind of this woman is very, very fragile. We have to look at their mind and treat them. So we don't have to only give them a child. We don't only focus on the uterus, but look at improve her heart, improve her metabolism, improve bone health, improve breathing, improve, that's called OSA. They have OSAs, improve their brain growth, uh, means make them more free and happy. Is all we do. And now, assessment of the patient when they come to us. We have to assess all these things. In case a woman comes who's got a PCO, any phenotype, phenotype one, two, three, four, any combination, any definition, do these things. Blood sugar, weight, blood pressure, smoking, alcohol, diet, exercise, sleep, mental, emotional, sexual health is very important because a lot of, lot of these women are obese and they are in depression. So we have to look at them and counsel them properly, depending upon our capabilities. 
improve their reproductive and operational outcomes and aligning with the recommendations for general public and after the pregnancy also we have to keep telling them about what all problems they can have for the child and themselves second question what people do is they go to pco patients and i find that they have done six iois 10 iois and they have not done any tubal test so when i ask why have they why have you not done they say she had a pco why should we do so that's not the not, not the right answer they say when we know the cause of infertility we don't check the tubes i think oh, this is the wrong idea. answer nahi abhi nahi class karke jayenge so when you look at the pata nahi aaye when you look at the para para 5.1 and para uh, 5.1 dot four they say that tubal pregnancy should be considered prior to ovulation in women with pcos where there is where is a suspected tubal infertility i think we always suspect tubal infertility i think in case you want to try one out chance is okay but later on you must go and do their hsc as early as possible hsc is going to help you is no use that you carry out eight iuis or large number of iuis and then you find that she has got tubal blockage in country like ours where tb is pretty common tubal blockage is due to tb in our country to quite an extent chlamydial infections we are going to come out with a very beautiful resonance on, on chlamydia very soon then you all want to ask us that how do we do ovulation in such form what are the principles so i i checked up the hra guidelines chapter 5.2 why am i writing these things is that when you today today is a sunday or when you have time now covid is making sit us at home you relax and try to read these chapters and after you have read them then you can go to the appendix and algorithms and within i think you will take not more than one hour in mastering pcos so is is my promise is our promise that anyone who goes through i seat they after that they don't have to go anywhere you have the, all the answers with yourself so what are the ovulation induction principles we have to know that we can use any of these drugs letrozole metformin clomiphene no, exactly. depending upon what is what is allowed in that part of the world many countries have banned many drugs they don't allow they don't have fda approval so we have to see that where is it is it off label and where it is on that is the country's choice but overall rule out pregnancy before i have seen large number of people a woman comes and they give them five packets of pcu that keep taking it every month those poor they got they got they got they are pcu patients and they have some spotting and they start taking it every month for four to five months without any ultrasound and you find that they were pregnant and they were still taking clomiphene so i think we should do we have to exclude the pregnancy before we give her the second cycle of any of these drugs and uh, <clears throat> prolonged use of these drugs should be avoided we know that they can lead to cancer in case we give it for long time cancer can occur in case we give for more than it is possible there is a possibility that we may be having some problem but i won't i'm not going to touch that part today so before i move ahead what is normal ovulatory cycle here you have to know that there are two parts of an occ complex the outer part of this is very important for you to understand whole of ovulation process and inner part is called granulosa so granulosa will make aromatase and theca under lh will make androstenedione which will convert into estrogens so aromatase will primarily help in converting androstenedione into estrogen that's the way and here we have to use letrozole in case required so the aim of aromatase is to convert androstenedione into estrogen aromatase comes from the granulosa cell compound and androstenedione comes from the thicker cell compound this is what you have to know when we have a normal woman she has adequate amount of fatty acid body she has got low levels of e2 she has got low levels of lh so she makes one egg every so one follicle every month she is creating one mature follicle mono follicular uh, ovulation and the woman becomes pregnant because her e2 and lh are normal so fsh is adequate this is very very important and fsh comes for a small window it's got a limited secretion that's the way body behaves so fsh window is short e2 is low 
LH is low in the initially, so FSH keeps rising. So when we come to PCOS, here we find it's a very different phenomena occurring. Here we have high levels of E2 from the very beginning, high levels of LH from the very beginning. So in day two itself, we have got high E2, high LH, and when they both are high, we'll have low FSH. When FSH is low, women won't ovulate. So low FSH, high LH, high E2, high E2 will lead to an ovulation. And this is pathognomic of PCOS. Now, how do we treat? Drug of choice, letrozole. I won't go to letrozole much, but just to give you some idea, letrozole acts upon the conversion of androstenedione to estrogen. So it acts at inhibitor. That's an inhibitor. So it will suppress conversion of androstenedione into estrogens. So levels of E2 will go high. Uh, levels of E2 will go low here. This is the main concept. And we gave aromatic inhibitors, letrozole or anestrozole for this particular thing. So I'm just touching the topic. Rest in the classes we have learned. I have covered for all the classes in great length. And uh, this lecture primarily we take it at a great length for uh, the batch two. That is the IUI batch. So look at the recommendations now. We have EBR, we have CPP, and we have CPP here. I'm sure that uh, you know that CPP stand for clinical practice points and CPR stand for clinical consensus recommendations. And EBR is evidence-based recommendation. So EBR says first line of treatment. So there is no doubt for any patient coming to you, for monofollicular ovulation, we, we want, or she's got an ovulation. Lactrose is the first drug of choice. We had two curtain lasers on lactrose and ovulation induction, so I won't talk about it today, but lactrose is the drug of choice. Now, where it is not available, then, or not permitted, then we can use clomiphene or some other drug. So, multiple pregnancies appear to be less with lactrose as compared with clomiphene. So letros will lead to monofollicular growth. And this is what you have to tell people around you. So I'll repeat, letrol is the drug of choice and it will lead to monofollicular growth and a singleton pregnancy. Second drug, clomiphene and metformin. So when you come to clomiphene, it is being combined with the metformin very commonly. And the recommendation here is 5.4. So all the gentlemen, ladies who are present here, when you finish up, when the talk is over, do spend some time in reading these chapter five. You'll get better idea. Okay. So here you'll find that how do these things, uh, they, how does clomiphene work? Clomiphene works at the level of HPO, hypothalamus pituitary. Letrozole worked peripherally. It worked in blocking the conversion of androstenedione into estrogen. But clomiphene is working at the level of hypothalamus pituitary axis. Just remember this, I'm not talking not about clomiphene, but it will lead to bigger window of FSH. If put a longer window of FSH as compared to letrozole, as a result, there will be multiple follicles and multi-follicular multi growth and multiple pregnancy. So clomiphene is not recommended due to its mode of action on the mind, hypothalamus pituitary axis, and leading to multi-follicular growth it's got a longer window of FSH. So in case you want to use, we can use, EBR says we can use clomiphene, no problem, use, use it safely. You want to use metformin, EBR, use it, no problem at all. You can use it in the woman with PCOS. It will improve ovulation. So metformin is a good drug. As I've told you, in case we treat hyperinsulinemia or hyperendogenemia, we get better, good ovulation rates. So metformin works alone also works pretty well. They say clomiphene 5.4.3, clomiphene citrate could be used in preference when considering clomiphene or metformin for ovulation induction in women with PCOS who are obese, BMI is more than 30. They say that it can be used in preference when considering clomiphene citrate or metformin. When we have both the drugs, 
Clomiphene is, we want to use a single one, we can use Clomiphene. 5.4, if metformin is being used for ovulation induction in women with PCOs who are obese, more than BMI, more than 30 kilogram per meter square, Clomiphene can be added. So the BMI is more, then try to add Clomiphene and metformin. That is our take home message in the whole, whole uh, recommendation they have given. Here, multiple pregnancy increases, so, so be very careful. And also remember that whenever clomiphene has failed in a woman, you don't have letrozole, then add metformin. So drug of choice, letrozole, always. When letrozole fails, letrozole fails or letrozole is not, letrozole is not available, then we go to clomiphene. And when clomiphene has failed, then you add metformin. And when the BMI is more than 30, then you should add both clomiphene and metformin. So it's safer to add metformin here. Overall, you can add metformin with clomiphene. So how do metformin act? I will just take a break for 30 seconds. Read it yourself. Basically, I've told you it works at the level of tyrosine kinase. It increases activity, enhances glycogen synthesis, increase in recruitment and activity of GLUT4 glucose trans transporters. So this is the way metformin acts and there are multiple uh, diagrams and images you can see at the Google uh, Google site. I have also taken this image from there. So metformin is a wonderful drug and metformin can be used. Metformin, metformin works at GLUT translocation and it leads to transcription of the genes and a lot of things are happening at the level of uh, the GLUT transporters. It acts upon the insulin receptors itself and it's a good drug basically. So but metformin can suppress appetite enhance weight loss and this is what metformin does if you want to start with metformin start with 500 milligrams per day some people start with 800 milligrams per day i normally prefer 800 or 500 and then keep adding and you can go till i normally don't cross one gram per day but the dose you can go to maximum dose of two gram per day but i try to limit myself at one gram per day okay so metformin has got very good advantages, as you can see here. Uh, it will in, improve cyclicity. It will improve the it will improve the BMI here. BMI will come down. There will be spontaneous ovulation and uh, reduce levels of testosterone, reduce insulin. So metformin is a wonderful drug, and it can be easily used in women who have got PCO. Definitely, you can give it for long duration in them. Now coming to the gonadotropin. When we should use gonadotropins. Gonadotropins, EBR is para 5. It says that second line. So we use HMG, FSH as second line, not as the first line, as per the guidelines. But they have put in a script here. They say we can use them straight away in case you have ultrasound facility with you. But without ultrasound, they are the second line. But here, Tell the patient about the pricing. In case we do a cycle with letrozole, we spend rupees 3,000, uh, 300 maximum. But when we are going to HMG, uh, when we are going to HMG or FSH, we are somewhere spending around rupees 4,000 for that, approximately. So this is the amount of difference. And multiple ultrasounds have to be carried out. So tell the patient about these problems, and then you can definitely it becomes first line in case you have an ultrasound with you. And uh, that patient should be having an ovulatory infertility. So, EBR again says where available and affordable should be used in preference to clomiphene treatment combined with metformin therapy for ovulation induction. In women with PCOS with an ovulatory infertility, clomiphene resistance and no other infertility factors to improve. So, they say we can use letrozole or clomiphene. Or we can use it directly also. And in case you use it directly, you can combine it with metformin. So EBR says that evidence-based recommendation says that gonadotropins with addition of metformin could be used rather than gonadotropin alone in women with PCOs and anovulatory infertility, clomiphene resistance, and no other infertility factors to improve. So metformin can safely be added when we are giving somebody clomiphene or when we are giving somebody gonadotropins. So EBR says 
5.5 says that laparoscopic surgery can be given, can be done at the second line, or we can give borotropin. We have two choices here. Either we give HMG FSH or we carry out Leos for the patient. And then we carry out her ovulation again with the drugs or we can go to uh, gonotropins. Uh, then uh, when we come to, so in case we are getting more than two follicles at any point of time, which are mature, they say we should, we should cancel the cycle because it can lead to multiple pregnancy and multiple pregnancy is somehow not acceptable in women who are undergoing an IUI. So to avoid getting a multiple pregnancy, we should try to we try not to give somebody gonotropin induction uh, in case you're getting more than two or three follicles in the cycle. Okay, anti-obesity drugs. So anti-obesity drugs, I'm gonna use karna kini karna. That's a very important thing which comes to our mind here. So anti-obesity drugs are being recommended. People are taking it. Nothing wrong in it. But here. This is a small diagram as the TVs are becoming slimmer and finer, we are becoming fat. 2008, this. And now it is 2022. The things are pretty worse. And with COVID, I think the tummies have become like this, bigger ones. So the drug which is recommended is orally stat. That's all I want to tell you. There are multiple drugs. They work at various levels here, but we prefer orally stat. Okay. So there are multiple anti obesity drugs. I don't have any experience of only said I've never used it, but um, it can be used. So they have got FDA approval and uh, it works by inhibiting intestinal lipase activity. That's what I want to tell you about only status. But important for me will be algorithm three. So my dear friends who all are here present, I'm so happy that I see around 290 people still logged in at this point of time. Weight loss. Weight loss 5 to 10 percent within six months. So it is not that you start losing weight the same month. Ongoing monitoring is important in weight loss and maintenance. And go to a professional in case you want to go to a 10 percent weight loss will always give you good outcome. Don't be in a hurry to lose a lot of weight immediately. Have it very, very gradual. And within six months, you'll find dramatic improvement in your fertility potential. And the term is called smart hair. I told you a term called grade when I started. Grade, I hope you remember what grade is. The second term is smart. Specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, timely. That's only not only about PCOS. Whatever we do in our lives should be smart. So this is what we teach you in uh, total quality management classes also.